All right. Well, first off, thanks to TT for putting on year after year what, what I personally consider the, the best AEC tech event. Um, and these days, as I have to be a little bit more selective of what I can attend and not attend, I'm, I'm really happy to say that this is an easy decision every year. Um, so thank you, TT, for putting it on. And um, thank you for inviting me as a speaker. Hopefully, the story I have today is just as exciting as what we heard earlier. But um, to start it off with a quick intro, not so much because my uh, already inflated ne ego needs it, but because I think it's a nice segue to the story. So I studied architecture, um, grad, undergrad, the whole shebang, um, and I even started working while I was studying. So I did that for about seven years, and right after my official, you know, grad graduation, I was very fortunate to join the team at Kieran Timberlake and fortunate because they not only have a, a fantastic design practice, but because, um, as some of you know, they have a really great research group as well. And that was really kind of where my pivot slowly began from, you know, working in a traditional AEC kind of environment to focusing more on technology. But what I want to highlight about this image is like something, something looks a little odd, right? Because here you, you have me ending at a software company, but um, there isn't a single software company before that. Hmm, why is that? Um, and that's exactly the, the kind of way I want to start off today because the culture at Enscape, even before I got there, um, was very customer and industry focused, right? There are no shortage of Silicon Valley vets or Wall Street vets that uh, our board of directors and president kind of hired. Uh, to guide the product and tech strategy. Um, but again, it's, it's just really not part of the culture of Enscape, even, even before me. Um, the culture has always been to look inward and to let that, or sorry, to look outside in and to really let that drive everything else, frankly. So I want to start at the beginning. Um, so some of you may know these gentlemen, but these are the founders of Enscape, Thomas and Moritz. And about six years ago, they started Enscape version you know, 0.01. And they've since moved out of, of uh, daily operations. They're kind of advisors to the company now. But um, Thomas was really kind of the, the coder. He was a tech guy. Uh, he probably wrote over half the code base that we have today. And Moritz was really more on the business side. And he was, you know, helping bring in clients, bring in new work. But, but again, what's interesting about this diagram is neither of them really comes from AEC. So when I first joined, there were still kind of tapering off their involvement in the company, and I had a chance to, to talk to them during my interview. So I asked them the, you know, multi-million dollar question, you know, guys, how did you, how did you do this? How did you make something so successful um, and so loved by a community of users? And, you know, I, I got the same reply for both individually, but it was this kind of cheeky, oh, well, Peter, it was easy. We just, we just built what our customers told us to. Uh, so, so easy, right? Um, not so much. And the interesting thing is that that looks different um, depending on where you are in, in the stage of growth as a company. So where Thomas and Moritz were coming from was really the, the small business stage. And at that stage, you know, a thousand or less than a thousand customers, you can have a lot more of a direct relationship with each and every one. You can talk to them, you can meet with them. You can dedicate a lot more individual time to everybody and let that feedback come in, obviously find the common ground and, and start building something, right? And that's kind of literally what the process was. Uh, in the early days, Thomas and Moritz would talk to a customer, handful of customers, they would, you know, kind of get a feature list, and then they would just go to their developers and say, all right, guys, this is what we're doing today. Um, and it was successful, very successful, I would even argue in the early stages. But, you know, Enscape today is in a, is in a very, very different place. So to give you an idea, we have about or over rather 22,000 commercial customers, and over 200,000 unique monthly users is a lot of people. Um, there's no way that we could possibly, you know, donate the level of individuality that we were donating before um, to this huge and, and growing customer base. I think if I had to recreate this slide at the end of this week, it would, it would be different. I mean, this slide's already outdated. Um, so it really forces the question of how do you keep that focus on the industry and on the customers while enabling um, or preparing for this kind of rapid growth? So and I think this is the stage in, in a lot of companies' life cycle where you really start investing more into analytics, into big data, right? You collect uh, information on usage, you collect this into that, um, and you really try to find patterns in that data in order to derive insights, which is, is absolutely necessary, no doubt. Um, but, you know, you also kind of don't want to forget or don't want to lose 
um, that element of, of individuality or, or the, the anecdotal side um, of, of the small scale business, which really is what was the foundation for being so successful and for even for having this kind of um, scale problem. But, but it is a problem for sure. And there, with it, I think, comes the, the challenge of, of industry diversity as well. So this is AIA data. So admittedly, it's uh, limited to the U.S. But, you know, if we extrapolate to the rest of the world, I, I don't see it being too, too different. And what it's essentially telling us is that 76% of the architecture firms in this country are one to nine employees. Um, that's pretty interesting. That's really interesting because when we kind of think about meeting the needs of that whole community, you look at just this one example of segmentation, right? You could segment it by market, by hospitality, you know, industrial, whatever. Um, but you can already imagine that based on the scale of a company, the, the needs of our users are, are wildly different. And, and what works for uh, a shop or an MDBJ, you know, may not really be accessible to a firm with two or three people that don't have um, a certain experience or knowledge in terms of working with a lot of these tools. So it's really challenging and, and you can no longer build what somebody tells you to per se, because if you build what, you know, column A or, or sorry, row one uh, once, then you're probably going to piss off row three and vice versa and vice versa. Um, you really have to zoom out a little bit more and, and think about this at a, at, a, at a grander scale. So the way I kind of think about it is um, with a little diagram where, you know, if you imagine the goals of a business and imagine the goals of the industry that you're or the customers you're, you're really trying to meet, you, you want to align those as closely as possible. Right. And, you know, I think if you wake up a lot of CEOs in the middle of the night and say, hey, what's your job? What is your business's purpose? And, you know, the easy answer is, oh, well, we make money. Yeah, sure, you make money. But, you know, the question of how is also pretty important. And for me, it's about, you know, merging these a lot closer together. And this is where that term industry uh, comes from, because we, we can't focus on individual customers as much as we want to. We really have to zoom out and look at the, the entire industry, because a lot of the um, kind of the minutia of problems, um, that are being faced by customers are actually manifested in other parts of the design team, of the construction team. Um, they just look different. And, and it's less so that that is the actual problem. It's more so that it's maybe a symptom of a bigger problem. And um, without that zooming out, you, you kind of don't know necessarily what to target and if you're even targeting the right thing. So we use this next slide here um, internally a lot. And we say that we're industry driven, right? We, we want to identify and solve our customers uh, biggest problems. And we use this internally to organize, but I think we've presented this externally as well. It, it, it's no big secret. Um, but again, it's, it's really what we organize around. And when we kind of evaluate a feature or evaluate something on the roadmap of strategy, we, we always come back to this and ask ourselves a question of, well, okay, with feature X or Y, what's the actual problem that you're solving? Is it just something that you heard somebody want, or is it actually, you know, a meaningful contribution to a process and a workflow? And I think this is also where that industry experience becomes um, pretty, not just relevant, but critical, right? Because, and as some talks even touched on this um, earlier today, you can have really great technology, but if you apply it to the wrong process or to a process you don't understand, it, the, the value impact at the end may or may not be there. It may even be the opposite of a value impact, it might detract from value. So uh, I want to talk a little bit more about how that plays out and some specifics. So. Um, this product development hierarchy is something that I use a lot with our, our product management team, but um, it's very simple. Those of you that know me know I like using a kind of kind of bullshit shapes to do diagrams. Um, but at the bottom of this pyramid, I don't have a name for the pyramid yet. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid are what I call product cases. And again, that's that's supposed to be that should be a difficult and valuable problem for, for our core community for our industry. Um, that's really the foundation. And on top of that, you layer on what I call our strategies, which is really how the, the how. Um, and those of you that have used Enscape, you can probably even start extrapolating uh, some of those strategies already, but we'll take a look at some examples of the next slide. And at the very, very top, you have your actual features. And these are you know, the little bits of functionality that actually enact uh, those strategies that then of course, you know, make the product cases uh, possible. It, it, it allows you to solve a problem uh, X or Y. Let's look at it a little bit more concretely, again, going from the bottom up. So just one example, but, but for me, I think most of the things that we evaluate uh, as far as product cases, it, are, it revolves around these three criteria. Are you reducing time, reducing cost, or reducing quality? Ideally, you want to do all three, right? That would be the, the holy trifecta of, 
uh, enabling somebody in this industry. But sometimes there's a bit of a trade-off. And usually that trade-off is, you know, when you bump up quality, guess what? Well, time and cost probably increase as well. So it's a bit of a balancing act, but, but those are really the, some of the, the most primary metrics that we use when we evaluate a product development opportunity. Um, on top of that, like I said, there's uh, more strategies than listed here, but you know, the, the biggest ones that come to mind are always accessibility, performance, um, and centralizing of, of project information. Um, if we think of that diversity, diversity of industry slide we looked at earlier, accessibility is, is really, really key because if you really wanna meet the goals of an industry, move the needle forward, um, you, you have to impact everybody. You know, if, if you create a solution and say, well, this can only be used by super users that only 2% of the firms have, like, you're not really impacting the industry. I mean, you, you'll probably still sell some licenses and make, you know, a good deal of money, but, you know, you're not moving the needle of, of the industry. You're not actually enabling any kind of progress. So that accessibility, that ease of use is, is really critical for us, but also makes it very challenging to develop um, certain things because a lot of the complexity that resides inherently in some of these workflows like computer graphics, you know, whatever else, um, it, it, it's not so easy to translate down to such a such an accessible and easy to use level, but but it has to happen really. Um, and on top of that are, you know, all the different features that may or may not kind of exist. Um, another example, so every team at Enscape has customer touch points. And as I was thinking actually last night there is actually one team that doesn't and i think that's our um that's our hr team but you know that's that's somewhat understandable they they their entire focus is being internal right but everybody else and these are all the other teams organizations whatever you want to call them at enscape um you can't avoid customer contact not that anybody wants to but i think it's part of that formula that that really keeps the focus and i won't do us the favor here of reading you know text out of the slide but uh, the, the touch points look different, I think, for every team, and, and for some, there's even overlap, but the fact that they're there, just the fact that they're there, I think, is maybe even, you know, 60% of the battle, because you can never run too far, you know, to the left or right or ahead um, without always being tethered to the reality of what a customer needs, wants, uh, so on and so forth, and I think that's pretty critical. I think not only do we have you know, our day-to-day -day processes where we, you know, inject customer stories, interviews, whatever, but this just being, I mean, literally in, in, in the day-to-day -day workflow of everybody is a, is a huge reminder. And I, I think a very, very positive thing. Um, and, you know, if somebody's out there sitting and thinking like, man, I'm a developer, I would hate doing that. You know, to be fair, like, I don't think we've gotten any negative feedback from our teams and we have a very open uh, culture where everybody can communicate concerns, issues, whatever. But, you know, I haven't heard from a single developer or, I don't know, a finance licensing person like, man, Peter, I just hate talking to customers. It's actually quite the opposite. Um, and we're also at the stage where six years in, as we've been maintaining this culture, there's, there's a really nice rapport between us and the community. Um, and I think part of it, that is what makes that uh, relationship so engaging for both parties. You know, because it's, it's never a negative one. I mean, even when there's critique or criticism, it's never kind of, it's never for the wrong reasons. It's always for the right reasons. And there's a productive way to have those conversations for sure. So what then kind of happens is that, you know, everybody has their own touch points, but everything is of course, ultimately fed back into product management. And the job of that team really is to just synthesize everything as concisely as possible into a, a concrete roadmap that will, you know, you can't make everybody equally happy, but what I like to tell our PM team is that you got to make everybody equally unhappy. Um, that one is very doable. That one is very doable and it makes the, the task a lot more manageable, but product management's job really is to aggregate all of those individual findings from the different teams uh, through, through customer engagements and make sure that the roadmap and the strategy responds um, in the best way possible. Um, going back to that element of anecdotal with the analytical. So, for our product process, we use these two tools quite extensively. Um, you may be familiar with some of them already. So Tableau is a, a data visualization platform. We, we really use that to look at different numbers, usage tracking on features, sales and churn, you know, so on and so forth. Um, product board is, uh, you, some of you may be less familiar with that, but it's, it's just a product management platform. And we also use that for a number of analytical things we do. Uh, feature evaluations, we evaluate complexity with our engineers, so on and so forth. Um, but we also use it as a platform to centralize and aggregate some of that anecdotal information. So if there's feedback from a customer, like maybe 
uh, Dan, who's in the audience, he's our head of sales in America. Maybe he's talked to a customer that has a feature request or a gripe with an existing workflow. Um, you can send it to us or send it directly to the product board and we aggregate everything kind of in there. But it, it's a mixture of analytical and anecdotal because the anecdotal, for me, it's really necessary to give, to give flavor and understanding the numbers. Because if you just present the raw numbers to, to somebody, especially somebody without industry experience, um, it's very easy, I think, to, to take the wrong takeaway. You have to have a layer of, of real conversations and, and real anecdotes to be able to support or, or refute some of these things. Um, so we also have that in the form of uh, processes, not just tools. Uh, we, we like to engage customers uh, very, very actively. And some of those are uh, very kind of formal things like a survey, like a user event. We did our first one um, earlier this year. But some are, some are way less formal. Some are uh, jumping on a Microsoft Teams chat with the customer. And believe it or not, I actually do that sometimes. And other, others do it as well. It's, it's not something that is just limited to the customer support team. Um, but again, it's a mixture of formal and informal because we want to keep that data side by side with, with, with a layer of, of understanding. And like I keep saying, a little bit of flavor uh, to those numbers. Uh, we also know that it's pretty critical to, to create forums and, and avenues for, for the community to share their feedback. Um, so like I said, on the left here, we had our first user event um, ever this year. And it was all virtual because of COVID, you know, a bit of a bummer. But uh, it was a great experience, I think, not just for us, but for, for the community that joined us. And at least that's the feedback we're getting so far. Um, and to the right, we have something that's kind of more, more ongoing. That's our forum. Uh, of course, that's been there from the start. But uh, just another way for, for those of us that are more opinionated or, or, or have something to share to, to be able to do it, you know, regardless of a scheduled event, regardless of a survey prompt, right? This is something that you can open up and, and type on any day of the week. So um, we wanna make sure we enable that expression for our, our community, both formally and informally as much as possible. And I am, I think, close to time. So I wanna say thank you again to everybody and hopefully we'll see each other next year.